Olive Levy moved home to Kinnegad from the UK five years ago back to the family farm. I loved working on the farm with Dad, Do you know, absolutely, like especially this time of year, calving season. Uh, it would always be, yeah, I calved my first cow when I was eight. So, uh, yeah, we always, always were, had to chip in, like any rural family farm, everyone had to chip in, um, but I particularly loved it. The 20 hectare forestry holding was planted on an out farm when Olive was away in college. But since moving home, she has fallen in love with the plantation and stepped in to manage it full time. Yeah, and especially as a female, it was even more daunting. But I have to say a lot of it was through the producer group, the local producer group. They were incredibly supportive and encouraging and just really kept encouraging me to stick at it and kind of get stuck in. And I suppose the more I was here, the more I was like, sure, I can do that myself. And I learned how to use a chainsaw and I started doing some of the thinnings. The forest, comprised mainly of Norway spruce with minor blocks of ash and sycamore, was coming up to first thinning. Olive started looking at how she was going to make a living. She started a local firewood business as an outlet for some of the thinnings. But she then began to look at how to manage the woodland in the long term and she came across the idea of continuous cover forestry. So when I sat down and I was looking at this, absolutely, it was all about you plant, you get your grants, you thin, you clear fell, you start again. But I was sitting thinking about that going, well, that doesn't really make any sense for me because we, if we were to do clear fell, we'd be clear felling this in, what, 15 years, which would be nice to get a nice little pot of money. I hope I'm alive longer than 15 years. So when I was sitting going, what am I going to do after that? And for starters, that pot, you also then have to take out the cost of replanting, potentially dealing with pine weevil, vegetation, do you know, on this. And then there's no return then. There would be no return in the rest of my lifetime. So I'm like, what am I going to do? So that was kind of one of the first things that got me looking at what other ways can I manage this wood outside of the Clearfell model. That, you know, was a big one. Another really big one that was important to me, during this time we started to see the first signs of ash dieback. So we've got three species here, ash, sycamore, Norway spruce. And next thing, all my ash is gone. And I was like, okay. And then I started hearing about the spruce bark beetle that's ravaging Norway spruce all across Europe. And I'm like, if that gets in here, I'm snookered. Like that is it done. So I was like, I need to address this and I need to address this now. So we continue as cover. It's allowing me now to start introducing new species to build the resilience within the wood as early as I possibly can. If I continue just on a clear fill model, I could lose everything way before it reaches its, you know, its top yes. value. So at least now I'm trying to hedge my bets. I want to introduce as many new species as I possibly can that will thrive in this area. Um, there will always be spruce here. I love spruce forests, but... I just Producing high quality timber and achieving a good economic return is one of the top goals of CCF management. And Olive called forester Manus Crowley to help her achieve her goals. When Olive contacted me, the, the first thing we do is to come and carry out a site visit. Um, the most immediate thing is the site conditions, soil conditions. Is it a peaty soil? Is it a wet soil? Is it an exposed site? Is it tall and untinned is pretty critical for a CCF. Um, sometimes people who are interested in CCF, they kind of come a little bit late and they might present a site that's 25 years old and untinned. It's not that it's not possible to do it, but it is definitely harder because once you start tinning and opening up a woodland, you do introduce an element of uh, potential for wind blow on a site. So that, that would be one of the first things. But if a site has peaty soils, it's slightly less stable. You know, it's a softer material. Trees are prone to rocking more over and back. Um, so there is a greater potential for wind blow. Now, on a peaty soil, how you counteract that is you would tin earlier. Olive also joined Pro Silva Ireland, a large organisation right across Europe that promotes CCF management. Liam Byrne is the current chair of the group. He was hooked on CCF when he attended a field trip on continuous cover over 20 years ago and met foresters talking about habitat management and timber production in the same breath. Just listening to the enthusiasm, uh, to his enthusiasm and his approach to forest management and the integration of timber production and uh, habitat um, 
habitat enhancement and protection i was in, i i i i, I was uh, enthralled by that uh, hugh denman was there that day and he was talking about red squirrels and timberjack harvesters in equal measure and timber production and birds nesting in the forest whereas before that uh, it was always seen as cutting trees conflicted with the protection of a forest and to think that we could integrate uh, that we could integrate all functions into the one forest absolutely enthused me and uh, from so that was back around 1999 2000 so from ever since we've been uh, on, a, uh, on a journey. Manus has been working with Olive since the first thinning on site and they've been implementing CCF principles from the beginning. The very first intervention is relatively similar to a standard first thinning. Um, there's a few subtle differences in that you would possibly have slightly wider space in between the racks. A typical standard first tenant would be a one and seven, whereas with CCF you might try to push it to one and eight or one and ten, whatever you can support. If you think about it, you've obviously left more trees in between the rack to work with in future, so potentially you've, you have a longer period to have trees in the stand. Slight subtle differences would be removing larger trees from the stand earlier in the rotation. A conventional harvester would want to keep these trees because when you bring it to saw log clear fell stage, you know, they can be bundled into saw log. Whereas we're trying to retain the stand for as long as possible. So by removing a larger tree, you're releasing the smaller trees around it, allowing them to grow to be larger trees. A typical crown thinning approach. This uh, tree here is a uh very high quality sycamore tree. Uh, you can see it's got a, quite a clean stem up to about five or six meters. There's only a couple of branches up there so uh, it will produce a lovely sycamore saw log in 40 or 50 years time or more. So what we do is we mark that tree for retention so we use a white paint on that tree just to identify that as a high quality tree. The reason for doing that is it actually helps the harvester operator to know that this is a high quality tree and that's the tree that needs to be protected in the stand. So now we have to select a number of trees that we'll take away from that tree to release its crown okay. from the canopy. And Liam, with the, uh, from an operator's point of view, is it, do you always use, is this, the, is this the colour system you always use, Liam? Yeah, um, generally, and there's actually a pro-silver protocol, marking protocol on that, and white, generally white is uh, donates and identifies long-term retention trees. Um, there may be other colours used, other owners, foresters may use colours like blue. The most widely recognised is white, I think we uh, practice widely. And then we use a more fluorescent colour for removal, very often orange or pink. That's easily seen and identified from a distance. One of the aims of CCF is to encourage natural regeneration of trees on site. These might be seeded in from nature or the owner will undertake underplanting to diversify the species on site. Well, it's initially because we really are very limited. We just have, well now, two species here. I am going to do a lot of underplanting over the next few years. That's kind of the key aim. And that is one of the things with the grant system. You do get grants to um, with the underplanting. But like we've I'm already seen beech saplings coming up in under the sycamore. So the idea is to kind of nurture them along and allow that sap seed. There's loads of jays here and they're all bringing in and finding little oak saplings bear coming up around as well. So the more we kind of open it up and allow space for these to self seed. So ultimately the idea is in 15, 20 years, it'll all just be natural regeneration. And then but that allows it to be resilient to climate change as well, because it's species and tree individual trees that are able to cope with what's going on in the environment right now are the ones that will grow so actually you're increasing your resilience by managing a site under ccf you're building resilience into a stand because generally with them we're going to have multiple species in the stand multiple ages multiple sizes so you can have large trees small trees big trees trees of all size diameters trees of all species you imagine if a, a massive storm event happened here in the wood tomorrow and we had a fully transformed woodland and all the medium sized trees or the very large trees get blown down. Every one will do. But we still have all the really small trees and all these other trees, you know. So we still have a forest here and it'll eventually recover and come back to something else. 
or if a disease comes in that only attacks sycamore, but sycamore is only a component of the woodland and they're spread all throughout and we've eight other species in the forest. So from a resilience point of view, it's, it's definitely better. You know, the aim is to have an entire woodland full of different species of trees at different levels and you can pick which ones you want to take this year, you want to leave, and that just opens your market. You know, you're in control, you've got your product. CCF is always aiming to return a consistent income to the woodland owner, but it can also deliver on a number of other fronts. There's multiple functions of a forest. Um, critically here, from an ecological point of view, there's a, a water course that flows along the boundary of the site that eventually connects with an SAC or a, a, a European Natura site downstream. And even within the site, there are water courses. So not even talking about commercial benefits or anything like that, but purely the act of not clear felling the forest is protecting those water courses. When you clear fell a stand, obviously you've totally exposed soils. The rain lashes down and siltation, sedimentation is washed straight into our water courses, ends up in our trout streams, eventually into the lakes. You know, so there's a, there is a significant impact from forestry that needs to be managed and, it, it, and equally it can be managed in clear fell systems as well like there's mitigation of setbacks from rivers and that it is harder for the owner the costs after clear felling of replanting a stand can be significant on paper we all say it can be like 10 to 20 percent of the cost is required to replant it but it's not even that it's the loss of financial return over that period you know you've a full 20 years after clear filing where you get no money until the next thinning i'm still just at the very start of this journey we've just completed our first thinning but the way i look at it is you're able you i'll have a much more consistent and regular income from it so i can be able to control that rather than this kind of one massive big peak and trough and like who knows kind of what's going to happen in the future so the idea of a more resilient you know stable income is very appealing. Managing forestry is a new option in the long story of family farming for the Levies and one that Olive is looking forward to. That's one of the reasons why I love actually managing this is that kind of that legacy like farming's been in our family for generations and generations and to be able to kind of continue working the land by managing this forest I think is it's a great sense of it's continuing that legacy and you don't have the same pressures and financial input that you need if I was to try and set back up into more conventional farming. So this I think is a perfect kind of way of staying in farming without those additional pressures. <laughs>